I was burdened down with sin. No happiness is found within. I never knew the meaning of joy down in my soul. When at last I finally knelt, content to fill my soul like I never felt. Heaven came down, there was glory all around when he saved my soul. I remember the day, remember the day when the Lord saved me. All the heaven came down, I was happy and free. Glory filled my soul, for I knew the Lord had made me whole. I shall never forget the day when the Lord saved me. If you're happy and you know it, notify your face. Amen. That sounded like a stand joke. Now like the peaceful dance, deep within my heart abides. Since the day that Jesus, he took my sins away. Now to heaven I will go, to spend the endless ages while they ever roll. Praising his name for the glorious day when he saved my soul. said take the stone away lifted his eyes began to pray then spoke three words 
that echoed through Amen. that place. Lazarus, come forth. And his word was sufficient. Three Roman crosses on a hill. Three men were tortured, nailed, and killed. Jesus, the word made flesh, was buried in the ground. Would God accept this sacrifice? Would his atoning blood suffice? He left no doubt when three days later he walked out. He's the living word, and the word is sufficient. For every question, every trial, every mountain, every mile, for correction, for reproof, for instruction and for truth, it will never pass away, and it's relevant today. It's God's Word, and His Word is sufficient. The Word is sufficient. The Word is sufficient. Amen. Yes, it is. open our Bibles this morning to Genesis, the book of Genesis, chapter 22. Two weeks ago when we began this uh, series on visions of Calvary, I began with a <clears throat> prehistoric look at Calvary, that is that before the foundations of the world were laid, God in his foreknowledge, knowing that man would fall, ordained a plan of redemption, and praise God he did. 
because we all need it. Amen. If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you need Him. Amen. Amen? It's not a, it doesn't matter whether we recognize we need Him or think we need Him. We need Him. Right. Just like the onset of so many diseases that take us in these days many times, we don't know we need a cure. We don't know we have a problem. But thank God that in His Word He's revealed spiritually we have a problem. Right. And our problem is sin. Right. Amen. The Bible says, As by one man sin entered in the world and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And we know we have a problem. And thank God that in God's foresight and seeing the need that man would have, He ordained a plan that the Lamb of God would be slain before the foundation of the world. And that is available to each and every one. The Bible says, to whosoever will may come, that redemption plan. And we're all in need of that this morning. And as we move into the Scriptures, uh, there's countless opportunities to present Calvary in many different places throughout the Old Testament that literally you could probably spend the rest of your ministry preaching on Old Testament pictures of Calvary. Even though I believe in my heart that the, the fulsome theme of Scripture is God is King and the kingdom that He would have, it's of necessity Calvary be a part of that picture. Amen? And as we begin to look in the Scriptures, if you want to look for a very great picture of Calvary in the Old Testament, you have to stop at this passage of Scripture in Genesis chapter 22, because hidden the words of this chapter are some of the greatest illustrations of Calvary thousands of years before it ever transpired. And even in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, when we're talking about Abraham in the hall of faith, we find there that it's mentioned that Abraham gave his only begotten son. And so it's on that premise that we look at this story this morning in Genesis chapter 22, Reading with me, the Bible says, And it came to pass, after these things, that God did tempt Abraham, and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. You know, that, that right there tells you a little something about Abraham. When God called, Abraham answered. Amen. I wish it was that way for people today, that when God calls on you, you'd answer. When God knocks on your heart's door and you need of salvation, that you'd give to Him and open the door and let Him come in. If God speaks to you in an area of separation or sanctification in this life, that we would answer God's call for that. But Abram was a man who answered God when God called. God said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him. And Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went, both of them, together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God, will provide himself a lamb for a bird offering. So they went, both of them, together. Let's pray. Father, we pray that as we look at these scriptures this morning, truly that, Lord, Calvary would be pressed upon our hearts. And Lord, I believe that many of the problems that we face in our Christianity are as a result of ungratefulness and unthankful hearts for what you've already done. Lord, our expectation is always that you will do something great on our behalf. But the truth of the matter is, you've already done that. And Lord, if you did nothing else for us 
except save our undeserving, wretched souls from an eternity in hellfire, it would be enough. So, Lord, we pray that that would be the pause of our hearts this morning to consider these things. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We're introduced uh, here this morning in this message to a man named Abraham. And just to give you a background, I'm sure many of you are familiar with who Abraham was. But in the book of Genesis, uh, we discover uh, how God discovered this man Abraham. This man Abraham lived in Ur of the Chaldees. He was wandering through spiritual wickedness and darkness. He was worshiping false gods, uh, lost in endless darkness, no doubt headed to uh, you know, an end of life without ever having known God. But one day God called. Amen. One day God spoke to this man named Abraham and he, he, he gave him grace. Amen? He gave him grace. Abraham didn't deserve God's call. He didn't deserve God to reach out to him. Nevertheless, God did. And we've seen men before this in Scripture, like Noah. Noah was just a man wandering around until one day he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And I'm thankful that one day, amen, God's grace discovered me, amen. And I was lost and undone and without hope and without God in this world. But there was a day when the grace of God shone into my heart, amen. That's how God discovered me, lost. Wicked, undone, without hope, amen. But in grace, He extended a hand to me. And God arrested this man Abraham and He gave him a great twofold vision. Not only of a land on this earth that could be His, that God promised to make His seed great and give him this uh, inheritance, but also, Hebrews tells us, a promise of a greater city. A celestial city. A city above, amen, whose ruler and maker is God. And God discovered this man, Abraham. We also see how God detached this man, Abraham, from the world he was living in. God gave Abraham a command. He said, you've got to leave your family. Leave your kindred. And he said, you've got to leave them and go to a land that I will show you. And you know the fact of the matter is, folks, that people are not willing to cross their families for God. Yep. Amen. That our family relationships, though important they be, are not more important than our relationship with God. And that's why Joshua said to the children of Israel later on, he said, choose you this day whom you will serve. You cannot serve two masters. Amen. And God detached Abraham. And he left his father's house and he left his kindred, and he, and he went in the way that the Lord gave him. He was no longer uh, to, to live a life of sight. He, in, in other words, he was no longer to look forward to the earthly inheritance that would be left him by his earthly uh, lineage. But no, he was to look beyond that with eyes of faith into a promise that God had made him. And dear friends, God has given us a promise of eternal life and we're to look past the inheritance of this world and the lineage of this world and we're to look on to inheritance that is incorruptible, that fadeth not away, that's reserved in heaven for us. Amen? And Abraham became detached from the things of this world and a hope and a future in this world. And then we see through Genesis how God developed this man, Abraham, he brought all kinds of experiences into the life of Abraham. And as uh, Pastor Mark uh, mentioned, uh, Mark and Offrey mentioned a few weeks ago, in, in Abraham's life, in some of these experiences that God brought his way, we see failure. Right. Amen. We also see successes. Amen. We see where Abraham uh, got his eyes back on the world and tried to figure things out in his own strength. But we always see how God in mercy and love drew him back, amen, to himself. Uh, you know, Abraham uh, went down to Egypt and, and, and lied and deceived down there and became rich and increased with this world's goods down there. He surely made some mistakes, but God developed him. God developed him into a man that staggered not at God's promises. 
Amen. You know, I want to be that kind of man. I want to be the kind of man you ought to desire to be the kind of woman that God can develop into one who would not stagger at the promises of God. Amen. Amen. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. We saw how, how many times in Abraham's life that he was giving up things in his life to prevent his spiritual life from being impaired. He gave up his life in Ur. He gave up the well-watered plains of Jordan. He gave up the spoils of war. He gave up on Hagar and Ishmael. Why? To take out of his life all those things that would hinder him spiritually. What an example. As God develops us as believers, as God develops us as Christians, He's trying to take things out of our lives that would distract us and and that would uh, beset us, the Bible says, as weights in our spiritual life. And God, finally, we see how God in Genesis displays this man. And you know there's no finer display of this man of faith than what we find here in Genesis chapter 22 on Mount Moriah, which Abraham later names Jehovah-Jireh. There's no greater display of the faith of a man as he would take his son up into a mountain, I'm sure that had been previously occupied by the Canaanites, offering their sacrifices uh, to their false gods. And as Abraham took that journey up that hill, he made a profound statement that has echoed through the ages that, Son, God will provide Himself a lamb. God displayed this great man Abraham on this mountain that we'll talk about here this morning. I'm sure that these were troubling times for Abraham. I'm sure Abraham, when he heard the voice of God on this particular day that we've read here in Genesis 22, when he heard God's voice, he was reminded of how God had interrupted his life when he was living in Ur of Chaldees. How God had brought him so far. How God had provided for him. How God had done such great things on his behalf. And surely Abraham, I mean, he was a great man. He, he, he had been able to win wars against his enemies at this point. He, he had been able to raise up in his own home servants that were like sons. Abraham truly was a great man. But on this day, this day recorded in Genesis 22, he heard the voice of God. And he sought fellowship, but he found a test. He sought fellowship, but he found a test. When God called, Abraham said, Behold, here am I. I'll guarantee you on that day, Abraham was not expecting to hear, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, unto a mountain that I will show you and offer him there. As a burnt sacrifice. I'm sure as God spoke, Abraham was reminded in his mind that God had promised that of Isaac he would make a great nation. That that Abraham's seed would be preserved through Isaac. And yet at the word of God, Abraham rose up early and made preparation to take his son to that place. And yet we know that Scripture records that Abraham did not stagger at the promise. Amen? I believe with all my heart that on the day that God told him he was to take his son and offer him as an offering to God, I believe the light dawned in Abraham's mind just as it had when he was in Ur of the Chaldees and had been promised to be given a land and made a great nation, I believe it dawned in the mind of Abraham that God was going to make a way. He didn't know how. He didn't understand. He couldn't see it. But he believed with all his heart that God would provide himself a lamb. That God would provide in Isaac's stead a sacrifice uh, that was required by God. And and I don't believe he wavered for a moment. It's not recorded in Scripture that he questioned God. But in simple, humble obedience, he took steps forward in this, what would seem, bizarre challenge 
that God had placed before her. There's several things I'd have us to notice this morning. First of all, I draw your attention unto the place. In Genesis chapter 22, if you'd look with me again in verse number 3, we'll notice the Bible says that Abraham rose up early, saddled his ass, took two of his young men with him, Isaac his son, he claved the wood, split the wood for the burnt offering, rose up and went unto the place. That accursed place. That terrible place where his son was going to be offered. If you look with me in verse 4, you see that they journeyed for three days. Interesting. They journeyed for three days. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw what? The place. The place. He saw the place. Can you, can you travel with me for just a moment in the life of Abraham just for a day with your son, your wood, your ass, your servants, and God has told you there will be a place where you'll offer him up to me. And for three days, Abraham journeyed towards the will of God, towards that place. For three days, his eyes did not want to see that place. He did not want to behold that place. He could not walk slowly enough. He did not want to get to that place. But on that third day, he lifted up his eyes and beheld that place. In verse number uh, 9, the Bible says, And they came to the place which God had told him of. And in verse 14 we find after this test that Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh. This was an ominous place. This was a place of great testing. This was a place of great trial. Imagine the day of departure. And by the way, for all you ladies that uh, you know get after us guys for leaving our packing to the last day, Abraham did too, okay? And he was a great man. He got, <laughs> amen. He got up that morning. You look at the scripture. The Bible says that he rose up and saddled his ass. This was an ass he'd saddled many times before, but he'd never saddled that ass to go and offer his son. And as he went to his stable that day and put that saddle on that ass, all the time in his mind resounded the place. The place. I don't want to go to that place. He saddled the ass, the scripture says, and he took two of his young men with him. He had to go find two of his young men, two of his servants. Hey, we're going to a place. He didn't know where it was, but he knew what was going to happen there. Right. The Bible tells us that he clave the wood for the burnt offering. And with every drop of that axe, he thought of the place. Right. He knew what the wood was for. He split the wood for the sacrifice, for the altar upon which he would lay, Hebrews 11 tells us, his only begotten son. Right. Finally, we see that he went. Not knowing where the place was. Not understanding how God was going to make a way. He went. He went. It took three days to reach that place. And we don't know if every day was spent in silence or if there was lighthearted conversation. After all, I, 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 I believe that the servants nor Isaac knew exactly what was about to transpire. I bet for Abraham, though, they were long days. Have you ever been on your path towards something that was not good and your children are lighthearted and they're still joyful and they're bouncing around and what's wrong, Daddy? What's wrong, Mommy? Nothing's wrong, son. Everything's going to be okay. God's going to work it out. But in your heart, there's a storm. In your heart, it's raging. 
And you don't know how it's going to work out. And you don't even know if it's going to be okay. And you're not sure what that moment, what that place, what that time is going to bring into your life. But you're assuring your day, it's okay. It'll be all right. You notice how Scripture tortures with the progression of this event. You notice seven times the word and in Genesis 22 and verse 3. And Abraham rose up and saddled his ass. You know, it could have just said Abraham got up and got everybody and everything together and they went. But no, no, this was a torturous procedural event. And everything he did in preparation stuck out as its own event leading to the place. He got up. He went and got some servants. He saddled his ass. And he clave the wood. And he went. In John 19, 19 and verse 17. Turn there with me if you would. Each moment, an individual torturous job in preparation for that place. In John 19 and verse 17, Scripture tells us of our Lord and Savior who bearing his cross. Oh, can we talk about the cross for a minute? Can we talk about the cross? That, that torturous Roman invention. Can we talk about what it was to carry a cross after your body had been, had been ripped apart by a whip? After the beard had been plucked out of his face? And after he'd been mocked and ridiculed by those he came to save, Jesus bore his cross to a place. The place of a skull. A place of offering. A place of sacrifice. Which in the Hebrew is called Galgoth. You know what Scripture records in Matthew 27? The same torturous process of events that Abraham endured and he rose up and he saddled the ass and he got his servants and he split the wood and he went. In Matthew 27 we read, and they stripped him and when they planted a crown of thorns, and they spit upon him, and they mocked him, and they gave him vinegar, and they crucified him in a place called Yoga. The place. The place. That's not all that I find in Genesis chapter 22. I find another phrase that appears... Two times, one in verse 6 and one in verse 8. Not only do we find similarities in the place of sacrifice, that, that uh, Abraham had to take his only begotten son, amen, to that place. But I wish you'd think a little bit further with me into verse number 6 where Abraham takes the wood and lays it upon Isaac his son and he took the fire in his hand and the knife. And notice this phrase. And they went, both of them, together. Notice again in verse number 8, Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a bird offering. And usually that's our exciting moment. We stop there, but Scripture records, So they went, both of them, Amen. together. Can I not only say this morning, I uh, have you to consider this awful place, but also the, the awful passion. There, there was a perfect understanding between the father and the son. Isaac was not dragged to this appointed place. He was limited in his knowledge of what would transpire. And did not our Lord say that the, the day, and I realize what he's talking about, but the day no man knoweth except the father. 
It's not that Jesus Christ was not God. It was that in his humanity, he chose to limit his knowledge. He chose not to know. And Isaac, he he chose not to know. He didn't badger his father. He did not press his father. He said, Father, we've got the wood. We've got the fire. But where's the lamb? Where's the lamb? Abraham and Isaac. Just as Christ and the Father went together unto that place. Every torture, every trouble, every rejection was not only felt by our Savior and Lord, but by the Creator God who witnessed the Father in heaven as they too went together to that place. You'll notice in our story of Abraham and Isaac that as they traveled to that place and on that third day, Abraham said in verse number 5 to his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder. This caravan came to a halt. And see, there is a point beyond which the servants could not go. And thus it was in Gethsemane's garden when Jesus withdrew Himself from his beloved disciples and said, rest here and pray with me. And he traveled on to have fellowship with the Father in prayer. And with all the will in the world, Peter, James, and John could not watch and pray. Have you ever marveled at that? That in the day of the Lord's greatest need, in the hour of the Lord's greatest need, the one who had allowed him to walk on the water and feed the thousands and heal the sick, in his greatest hour of need, they could not for one hour watch and pray. But they fell asleep. They could not enter into the agony of Christ. They could not Endure the pain of separation that he was about to endure. And in the moment that Peter should have chose to stay with the Lord, he denied him. And Ira Sankey wrote in his great hymn, the 90 and 9, he wrote, but none of the ransomed will ever know how deep were the waters crossed, nor how dark was the night that the Lord passed through Ere he found his sheep that was lost. Abraham called the caravan to a halt. The wood for the fire was taken from the servant and given to Isaac. And their load, their burden became his. And suddenly in that moment, Isaac for the first time felt the weight of what was about to transpire. The wood, the sacrifice, of course, had been there all the time, but now it was his. Now suddenly it would be his burden. And he would have to carry it alone the rest of the way. And above and beyond, all that is the case of our Lord, who always knew there was sin, but had never felt it. In all his temptations during his earthly life, never succumbed to it. Always resisted it. Always in perfect obedience to the Father. But in Gethsemane's garden, everything came into much sharper focus as those that were his greatest followers could not bear the agony, could not bear the weight, and for the first time, what was about to be accomplished at Calvary rested solely on the shoulders of our Savior as he poured out from his body a a sweat that was as great drops of blood. He had his first foretaste of unspeakable, of the unspeakable horrors of sin. And his instinctive cry in Matthew 26, 39 in his humanity was, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Suddenly, the measure of the cross had become worse. The sins of the whole world 
were heaped upon him. Psalms 22 and Psalm 69 do a wonderful job of describing the anguish that our Lord felt there. He who knew no sin became sin for us. We can never enter into that. I cannot pay your price for sin. You cannot pay the price for my sin. There was only one that could pay that price. In, in Isaac, we find in Genesis 22, as he was led to that altar and laid upon it, he saw in his father's hand the knife. The knife spoke of death. We see the fire That's, that spoke of, of that which for the sinner would come after death. Abraham prepared. Prepared for the questions that would arise. Said to his son's question of where is the land? He says, my son God will provide. So many times we think, well, Scripture should work. Well, God's way, I mean, it, it should get us through. Not Abraham. God will provide himself. He was ready. And with full understanding, with no further questioning, with no argument. But Father, we've never come up this, we've never offered without a lamb. We've always brought a lamb. None of that. In perfect and complete harmony, Father and Son walked up to that place. And friends, I'm here to tell you this morning, I believe with all my heart that in perfect and complete harmony. God the Father and His precious Son, the Lord Jesus, they too walk together to that place. Amen. I'm a father. I have sons. I cannot imagine how that must have been for Abraham and Isaac. I cannot imagine how that must have been for our Lord. You'll notice finally this morning in verse number 9 Scripture says and they came to the place which God had told them of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound. Would you notice again the tedious particular process of what transpires here? And they came to the place. And Abraham built an altar there. And laid the wood in order. And bound Isaac his son. And laid him in the altar. And stretched forth his hand. And took the knife to slay his son. And then we're brought back to reality. The truth is, in any picture... There's a point at which you must stop. And as Abraham raised his son in faith believing that God would be true to his promise, he heard that blessed voice out of heaven one more time that said to Abraham, he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him, for now I know that thou fearest God. Seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son. I'll bet you, that's terrible words to use considering the past. I will guarantee you that when Abraham heard that voice say, Abraham! Abraham! What does Abraham say? <laughs> Whew! Here am I. What do you want, Lord? Stretch forth not thine hand. For now I know. God, why would you put me through that? 
I'm sure he took that knife and unbound his son. And they embraced and they kissed and they danced and they jumped and they shouted and they danced all around and they heard, And they looked over and by the providential hand of God, they found a ram. Now, I'm no farmer, but one thing I do know is a lamb is not a ram. They found a ram caught in a thicket. And it was an acceptable offering to offer in that moment of time in thankfulness to God for his unspeakable gift of grace. And that, you know what, you know what Abraham calls him? He calls him everlasting father. Yeah. I know your promises are true. Everlasting father, he says. Amen. Everlasting father. Amen. Amen. And, and they embraced and they hugged and they kissed and they danced and they offered the provision of God, that ram that had been caught in the thicket, and they offered that as an offering to God. And in, in verse number 14, the Bible says, And Abraham called the name of, praise God, that place. What was a place of treachery? What was ominous? What was the unknown? Praise God. The Bible says, In the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. I've seen the mercy of God. I've seen the promise of God fulfilled. I've seen the grace of God. But there's still a question. There's still a question today that resounds through the ages, past Mount Moriah, past what was seen on that day in that place. The question that Isaac asked his father, where is the lamb? Where is the lamb? Still resounds. It still resounds. It still resounds until one day, praise God, out of the wilderness came a man clothed in camel skin, eating wild honey and locusts. And that man proclaimed the way of the Lord. And when Jesus came by, he looked upon the face of the incarnate Son of God. And he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And through through the life of that man, God incarnate, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, we watched Him in all His splendor walk up Calvary's hill, He and the Father together to offer Himself a sacrifice for the sin of the whole world. Amen. And I'm telling you, there is a Lamb. There is a Lamb. There is a Lamb. Amen. And He's here this morning. And He's calling for you. The question was answered on Calvary's hill. There is a lamb. The lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Now looking back at Moriah, looking back at Abraham and Isaac, we can see the eternal beginning and ending, the great I Am setting the stage and dropping little handfuls of purpose for us to look back and say, this never occurred to God. This was the plan of God. And he orchestrated the life of Abraham and Isaac in such a way that as we read through the precious pages of Scripture, we can see down through the annals of time to the place called Golgotha, that old Old place of a skull to the rugged cross upon which our Savior bled and died and say, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. That Roman centurion who had his part in placing him there stood in awe and wonder at the spotless Lamb of God and proclaimed for all those around to hear, Surely this man is the Son of God. 
And I tell you this morning on the authority of God's word, surely this man is the Son of God. Amen. Don't look for another. There will not be one who will come. There's only one that's already been professed, demonstrating no greater love that you'll ever see on the face of this earth than what was displayed at Calvary. For us who were sinners, for us who did not seek after him, one day the Lamb of God came calling. Brandon, Brandon, behold, the Lamb of God was taken away the sin of the world. Have you beheld the Lamb? Have you seen the Lamb? Amen. you got to look back to see the Lamb. There's no church. There's no baptism. There's no work. There's no, there's no class. There's no organization that could ever do for you what only Jesus Christ can do. Because this man, after he offered that sacrifice for sin forever, sat down on the right hand of God. You know what that Bible tells me? He's ever interceding. There's one mediator between God and man. I can't bring you to God. This church can't bring you to God. Your charitable givings can't bring you to God. Your service in the community can't bring you to God. Your scripture memorization can't bring you to God. This, listen, there's nothing, it's not of works which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saves us. If you haven't come by the way of the cross, if you haven't come by the blood-sprinkled way of the perfect, spotless Lamb of God, then you have not come. Amen. Jesus said of Himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by Me. Have you seen the Lamb? 